Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It It's r- almost noon. It's almost noon, but welcome, everyone. It is Friday, April the 5th, 2024. It is currently 11.53 a.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central Studio, located right here in Abilene, Texas. Do you own a Bible? Now, obviously, almost everyone in America owns a Bible. They own probably two, three, four, five. You, we all own a Bible. Almost everyone does. So I'm pretty sure that that's kind of a, just a rhetorical question. I know that if you're listening to a theology podcast, most likely you own a Bible. So we own a Bible. And when we talk about what are we to do with that Bible, we know that pastors and preachers, and if you go to seminary, Bible college, wherever, you're going to learn basically what are you to do with a Bible? Yours too read the Bible. You are to study the Bible. You are to meditate on the Bible. You are to memorize the Bible. You are to seek to obey the Bible. You are to seek to share the Bible. Those are some of the things that we would talk about. Hey, what are you to do with your Bible? You're to read it. You're to study it. You're to memorize it, right? I mean, oh, we, we talk about these things over and over and over and over again. They show up in sermon after sermon after sermon. But What if I was to tell you that on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday, someone walked into a Walgreens, they had a Bible, well, and they, they used their Bible not to read, not to study, not to memorize, not to meditate, not to share, but they used the Bible to hit someone to hit a Walgreens worker with their Bible. They had their Bible and they struck the other person. They actually hit the other person with their Bible. Now, would you be like, oh, come on, that that sounds ridiculous. Well, what if I was to tell you it's an actual news story? Are you ready? Here is the headline. Here is the actual news headline. When I saw this, I immediately saved it and said, okay, I don't know which day, which time, but we're, we are going to talk about this. So, so here is the actual headline. This was published April the 2nd, 2024. Here is the actual headline. Man arrested for Easter Bible belting of Walgreen worker, Walgreens worker, cops say. Let me read that headline again. Yes, I'm a professional broadcaster. You can tell. Let me read that one more time. Man arrested for Easter Bible belting of Walgreens worker, cops say. That it has to be one of the most ridiculous headlines I've ever seen. I'm like, wait a minute. Man is arrested for an Easter Bible belting. They, they go into a Walgreens and they, the, the word they use, belt, hit, strike someone with their Bible. I mean, what happened in that Walgreens that you turn your Bible into a weapon and you're like, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to smack you with it. Like what, what is going on? Let's see if we can get some information here. Here's the story. On Easter, the manager of a Walgreens store suffered a Bible belting because she was being rude, according to a customer who is now facing a felony battery charge. (laughs) A felony battery charge because you used your Bible to belt someone because you thought they were being rude. I have my Bible. So was that... So were they on their way to church? Did they just they they just leave church and need to stop by Walgreens? And they decided to carry their Bible into Walgreens. Maybe maybe they were walking, maybe they were walking home and they decided okay, they had their Bible in their hand. Maybe they decided to walk into the store, but then someone is rude and your first thought is that book you're holding in your hand, that Bible and you just smack them with it. Wait, wait, wait. Let, let's see if we can get some more information. Police say Peter Owens, 35, went to the pharmacy Sunday evening to purchase a pair of headphones. While at the Clearwater, Florida business, Owens got into a verbal altercation with an employee over the headphones, according to a criminal complaint. When Nicole Merck 
the 36-year-old store manager approached Owens, seen at right, and there's a picture of him, and asked him to leave the Walgreens. Peter used the brown Bible in his hand and struck Nicole in the face one time before he exited the store. After the alleged Bible battery, cops located Owens and took him into custody. After being read his rights, Owens reportedly admitted to striking Merck in the face one time with the Bible because, I quote, she was being rude to him. Pete, Peter stated he did not mean to hit her. I didn't mean to hit her, but I hit her because she was being rude. But I didn't mean to hit her. So did you just mean to swing your Bible at them? Okay. The criminal charge against Owens was enhanced to a felony count since he has a 2020 conviction in Michigan for assault and battery for which he was sentenced to a year's probation. Owens was released from the county jail last night after posting $5,000 bond. A judge was ordered a a judge has ordered him to have no contact with Merck and he must stay away from the Walgreens outlet. According to his Facebook page, Owens works as a golf instructor and is a Wayne State University graduate. All right. A Michigan native. (laughs) Maybe that's the problem. Okay. Owens now lives in a Gulf Coast city near Sarasota. All right. And then, well, that's it. That's all they have. They don't give us a lot of information. Now, it sounds like possibly this man is troubled. Maybe this man has a problem with anger. Maybe he has a, a problem with his temper. And, and so in some ways, now let, let, let's just make, just follow me here. It can be easy to, to judge. Now what the man did was obviously wrong. There's got to be legal consequences, not making any excuse at all. But we have a tendency. We have a tendency. If someone commits a certain sin, if someone does something wrong, and if they go to church, read the Bible, or say anything about God, immediately we're like, oh, what a stinking hypocrite. They, they shouldn't even be going to church. No, 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 no. Look, if you have a problem with anger, if you have a problem with any sin, if you're committing any sin, I don't care what the sin is. I don't care what the problem is. I don't care if it's sexual, not sexual, if it's anger, whatever the issue is, you know, where you need to be is what a Bible in your hand and in church, because we, the church is about a holy God who saved sinful people, not by making those sinful people necessarily better, but by imputing perfect righteousness to them by faith alone. That's that's the true gospel message is God is holy. We are not. We will never be able to keep his law perfectly. We are sinners and we need his mercy and grace. And by placing our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, his holiness and his righteousness is imputed. That means accredited to our account. It's not infused. It's credited to our account. And and we stand before him, him holy, even though we are not. We need to be there, no matter how flawed we are, no matter how sinful we are. We need to be there. That's where we need to be. I've seen situations where people are like, how dare you, you know, wait, what do you mean how dare they claim Christianity? They need, Christianity is for sinners, So on one hand, I'm not going to sit here and criticize or or say, man, you know, he should just read that Bible a little bit more or he should try. No, he he needs it. We all need it. Right. I have if if I'm going to condemn him, I should condemn myself. I have no business touching a Bible any more than anybody else. But I need what I need to hear of God and his holiness and his righteousness. I need to be convicted. I need to be challenged. So I'm not here to to say this is an example of of people who own a Bible but never read the Bible. You can read the Bible and have it memorized. You're still going to sin because we have a sinful nature and the sinful nature is not eradicated until glorification. So we're still going to sin. This is just much more magnified, right? Because it made it to the news. There was an actual physical assault. Now, he has to be held responsible. Absolutely. Absolutely. He, he, and he admitted it. That's good. And then hopefully that whatever the legal consequences have to be. But that doesn't mean he should never claim Christianity again or never touch a Bible. I mean, I don't know if he claims to be a Christian, but I, I, whatever the issue is, he, he should still hold on to that Bible, read it, still call out to God. And I'm not going to turn it into that. That's not the direction I want to take this. Here's the direction I want to take this. For many Christians, for many pastors, for many churches, we talk about reading the Bible. We talk about meditating on it, 
memorizing it and studying it, feeding upon it, sharing it. But throughout history, Christians, religious leaders, pastors, Christian parents have taken the Bible and used it in a way that really, they use it almost as a weapon, not as a spiritual weapon fighting a spiritual war, but they take the scriptures and use them really to bash people, to hit people, to strike people. They use it as a weapon to get their own way, to abuse, to control, to to get what they want. See, if you have the Bible on your side, then you feel like you can, you can, well, you can didn't do what you want and say what you want. We, we've seen po- politicians do this. You quote a scripture, sometimes so far out of context, ignore the overall teaching of scripture, and then use that to bash your political enemy or to somehow say your political viewpoint is the right one. And, and so many times it's simply, oh, if I have the Bible and I can quote something in the Bible, then you, we actually abuse people with it. In what ways in your Christian life have you used the Bible as a weapon to actually hurt people, to actually abuse people, to manipulate people? Oh, this is not the first, this is not the first time in, 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 that this has ever occurred. And it's not the last time this occurred. This is what we just read is a physical assault. I'm talking about the spiritual damage done by Christians because we take a Bible and we almost use it as a baseball bat to start smashing things, not as a sword to use in a spirit. There, it is to be used as a weapon in a spiritual way. We're talking about using it in a very negative way and a hurtful way. You may have heard of of two groups of individuals, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You may have heard of them. The Pharisees and Sadducees were the two prominent Jewish sects at the time of Jesus. And while they had differing beliefs and practices, both groups were criticized for using the scriptures and religion to oppress, control, and burden the people. Both groups were accused of doing this. In fact, Jesus found himself at times in conflict with them, well, not just at times, over and over and over and over again. And he they, he accused them of not really knowing the scriptures and how they were, in a sense, use the religion and use scripture to burden, to oppress, to hurt people. And sometimes Christians, I, and oh, I know I'm going to get myself in trouble with this, but it reminds me a lot of the United States military. Now, just stay with me. I was in the, the United States military for a very long time. And I know that with the United States military, you have all of these regulations. You have all of these instructions and regulations. And if someone decides, if someone in leadership is like, you know what? Don't like that person? I want that person out. I'm, I'm going to, they have so many rules and regulations that they can look through and they can find a way to say, oh, you're in trouble. Going to write you up. Oh, you're in trouble. Going to write, oh, oh, now. And next thing you know, you can start damaging their career. You may not be able to get rid of them in, in a week. You may not be able to get rid, rid of them in two years. But if you know what you're doing, you can write them up enough to begin to, to, uh, absolutely hurt their performance report. You hurt their performance report. That takes away points for them when they're trying to test for rank. And if they can't t- test for rank, they're going to hit high year tenure and you ultimately will get them out of the military. And I've seen people employ that. Hey, this person's got to go. And they start pulling, they, they start going after them for everything. They're, they're using those rules and instructions. They're really is supposed to try to just maintain order, maintain how things are supposed to be done, but you turn it into a weapon and you're like, I'm going to use this to go after that person. You're going to take them down. And religion can do the same thing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees did the same thing. Just, let's just consider the Pharisees. Legalism. The Pharisees were known for rigid adherence to legalistic interpretations of the Jewish law. So what they would do is like, here's the Bible. And then they would add and almost their, their legalistic interpretation be like, okay, you can't do this. 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 And you're like, I don't know if that was the original intent. I don't know if that's what was said. Doesn't matter. We've got scripture. We've got what God said. Are you going to go against God? And you're like, whoa, what, what is happening here? 
that would place heavy burdens on the people with numerous rules and regulations. And again, many cases, they were just using the basis of what God said, but then was adding to it. While presenting themselves as righteous and holy, the Pharisees often neglected justice, mercy, and compassion in their treatment of others. Hey, they would, they would focus on certain, certain rules about don't do this, don't do that. But then they would completely neglect the other part of God's word, mercy, compassion, justice, love. No, it was like, do this, don't do this, do this. You deserve to be punished. You deserve to be punished. Spiritual pride. They use their knowledge of the law to elevate themselves above others, leading to a sense of superiority and self-righteousness. Many Christians, because they know a little bit of the Bible, they will elevate themselves. Self-righteous, condemning, arrogant, jerks. They would control people through fear. By emphasizing strict obedience to their interpretation of the law, the Pharisees instilled fear and guilt in the people, exerting control over their lives. Now, that's the Pharisees. When you come to the Sadducees, the Sadducees, who were primarily aristocrats, uh, members of the Jewish priestly class, used their religious authority to maintain political power and influence. The Sadducees wanted political power, but utilizing God or scripture in certain ways to try to maintain or gain said power. Selective scriptural interpretation. They often focus solely on the writing of the Torah while rejecting the oral tradition and spiritual teaching embraced by the Pharisees, leading to a limited, sometimes distorted view of religious practice. Exploitation. The Sadducees were accused of exploiting the the positions of authority for personal gain, often at the expense of the common people. In their pursuit of political stability in favor with Roman authorities, the Sadducees compromised certain religious principles, alienating themselves from the broader Jewish community. Hey, hey, we will, hey, we were going to, we're going to work with the, this political party. We don't care about right or wrong, but because power, position, control, but all using religion, all using scripture. And Matthew chapter 23. And Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse uh, 2, or verse 1, Jesus spake to the multitude, and he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit at Moses, in Moses' seat. All, all therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that, ob- that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay on them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with one of their fingers. Say, hey, they, they, they will bind burdens on people. They will bind burdens. And they're taking God's law, taking God's word and using it to bind these burdens on people, to actually hurt to these these people. We we got the, in Luke uh, chapter 18, we have the the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And remember the Pharisee exalted, I thank thee God that I'm not like these other people. They, they, they used scripture and religion to exalt themselves. And remember the tax collector was like, wouldn't even look towards heaven. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything. Some, we can take the Bible to exalt ourselves, to create spiritual pride, we, that we now have the ultimate weapon to condemn people, to, to, in a sense, spiritually beat people, to spiritually break someone down. I, I could go on through scripture after scripture here, but what I like to do is sometimes hand you something. I should have probably done this for a today's focus because that's kind of what this is. So here's what I want you to think about today. First, I want you to look at your own life and think about how you have used scripture, maybe at times to actually hurt, abuse, manipulate, control, how you may have used scriptures ultimately to exalt yourself while pushing other people down. How you've used scripture to be condemning and, and, and only focusing on part of the word and not all of it. How you, you may have used scripture to condemn someone for something they've done, but you've forgotten the part about love and loving your enemy or turning the other cheek. 
You you take you take what you want from it and use it for your own selfish uh, reason by cl- by claiming you're doing you're doing what God wants. I've seen people do that. They did it during the Obama administration. I've seen some people do it during the Biden administration. They'll take a psalm, you know, uh, and and it was like, oh, talk about this person being removed from their office. And like, oh, I'm going to pray this. It's like, well, what about the scriptures that says, love your enemy and turn the other cheek? No, not going to. I'm going to grab this scripture because this seems like, oh, get rid of that person. And, and, and it's like you're grabbing one scripture, but you're ignoring other scriptures. How about praying for those, uh, praying for those in office, not that they'll be removed, not that they will be killed, but I don't know that, that they would come to a better understanding of God's word. Like that, so, pray something good, bless those who would use you, do good to them who would even persecute you. But we forget those. We only use what we want. The Bible is dangerous because Christians will take what they want from it and use it, but they're using it. And this is the key. They're, because they're, the way they use it, they don't see it. They're simply making themselves God. They're exalting themselves. Let, let, let's get, let's really, let's really now tick off everyone. Let's get this really practical. I've watched Christian parents do this nonsense. Oh, and I get all, I, Christian parents get so furious at me when I see these things. I've seen Christian parents who will grab the Bible and talk about worldliness, love, not the world. You can't, and then they will look to their teenager. You can't listen to that music. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do it because it's worldly, because it's ungodly, because, because it's sinful. And you're like, okay, so what's wrong? Well, it's secular music or it has bad words in it or this. And then the, the teenager's like, okay. And then, but it, they go back to the living room, sit in front of a television that's secular and in many cases has obscenities in it. You're like, wait a minute. I can't listen to this because it's worldly, it's secular, and it has obscenities. Well, you go watch a movie that's secular, worldly, and has obscenities. Do you not see that you're using scripture as a tool just because you don't like that music? It it bothers you. You're using it as a weapon. You use it as a weapon to tell the kids, you can't go here, you can't go there, you can't go here, you can't go there. Oh, because now you're going to use scripture to control them? Well, how about you apply it to yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah. Parents get really angry when I say that. I've seen, I've seen pastors do this nonsense. Give you all these rules that you can't do this and can't do that. Quote scripture and then you're like, uh, what about you? I've talked about uh, my independent fundamental Baptist church in Nebraska. Some of the ridiculous rules. Can't go to the movie theater because that's worldly. But the pastor's family could go to Blockbuster and rent 10 movies on a Friday? Uh, Wait, I can't go to the movie theater because it's worldly, but I can go to Blockbuster and rent 10 movies? I know that's dating the the, the situation, but that's just ridiculous. Hey, you can't listen to contemporary Christian music because of the the beat. The beat's evil. The beat's worldly. But you can watch uh, an entire Saturday of college football? Just this ridiculous, weird standards. No, no consistency. Oh, now, now, okay. I haven't offended you enough. Let me, let me try this one. Oh boy. Now this is really going to tick someone off. You ready? This is going to really tick some people off. But this is a good example of where the Bible just gets used as a weapon and, and, and certain people get targeted and some people don't. Two teenagers. Let's, we'll, we'll have four teenagers in the church. These, the four are two two different couples, right? One is a boy and a girl. They like each other. Someone finds out in the church they're engaged in premarital sex. They're engaged in fornication, and it's somewhat of a controversy. It's so, they're somewhat upset. They're, 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 people are definitely going to condemn it. Definitely say it's a sin. But the other couple, the other two, they're two girls. They're two guys, and they're engaged in sexual sin. But it's the sin of homosexuality. What, guess how the church will respond? Will not even be comparable. They will lose their ever living mind over the homosexuality. They will lose it. They it will be done. Those kids will probably be driven out of the church. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait. 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 What is going on here? What What is going on here? 
because we treat one differently than the other. You know why we treat it differently sometimes? Oh, we'll try to find a scripture and say, but, 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 look at how God treat. We could look, look, we could look at a lot of sins in the way God treated them. The point is, if it's a sin, it's, if it's a sin, it's a sin. There may be other uh, diff- uh, different consequences, but come on now. We got to be careful the way we do this because in many cases, guess what? We'll take the Bible and we've got no problem to take that thing, pull it back like a baseball bat and ready to smash the sins that we don't do, the sins that disgust us, the sins we don't struggle with. We will, we'll, we'll beat that. You can have a pastor up there screaming his full head off about some sin, maybe sexual sin or sexual addiction or pornography. He's just losing. Sinful, wrong, ungodly. You're not even men if you look at that stuff. You And, and just go on. And, and then you'll look at that pastor and you'll be like, you're like 300 pounds. I think the Bible says something about gluttony. Now, maybe it's a medical condition. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But if it isn't, I think maybe you could be approaching the area possibly called gluttony. So maybe you should be more understanding since you obviously can't stop eating. And the Bible condemns gluttony. Oh, but, but, no, but, but you're going to be smashing these people. See, we're, we're always so good at taking the Bible and bashing people and smacking them with it. Especially if we don't struggle with it. Especially if it's not our problem. Especially if we don't like it. Hey, if, if there's some pastor and we can't stand his theology, and look, we may have every right to condemn his theology. It may be not in line with historical, orthodox, biblical Christianity. And then something bad happens to them. Something happens to them. Or they commit a sin. And all of a sudden we come and we're ready to take that Bible and just smash them and smash them. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. We may disagree with their theology, but the Bible, why wouldn't we go and try to restore them and, and help them and love them and co- protect them? We, we, it's not about agreeing with their theology, but there's, there's a human being in pain and suffering. Or does the Bible not call about love and compassion? Does the Bible not call for restoration? Does the Bible not call? No. And it's like, it's like, nope, we don't like them. So we're going to use the scriptures now to condemn them. I've seen some of this just evil stuff that takes place. Oh, but let's go back to the church. Oh, this is where it can get really confusing. Let's go back. Let's let's take the the, the two teenagers who are same sex. Yeah, okay, we already talked about that. Now let's just let's just talk about the the two who are heterosexual, the, the boy and girl, right? Young young man, young woman. They're engaged in premarital sex fornication. Everybody's upset, everybody's committed, saying, You're sinful. That's wrong, that's sinful. But sitting up in the church, there's numerous couples who are married, got divorced, and are now remarried. And there's a high probability that even if you allow, even if you believe in the exception clause that some people find in the Bible that may allow for divorce, you get it, you still get into a lot of questions about possible remarriage, but you're going to have someone who I guarantee you, they got married, they got divorced and got remarried, and it probably does not even meet the very small exception clause, right? If you, if you believe it's there, we can get a whole discussion about it. But, and guess what? They, that means then they are committing adultery because the Bible even talks about if you if this person's divorced and they get remarried, they become an adulterer. Okay, well, now they're, they're, so you have someone in the church literally committing adultery. How consistently? I don't know. But every time they're together, they're committing adultery. Nobody says anything about it. Nobody does anything about it. They partake of the Lord's Supper. They may be a Sunday school teacher. Who knows what? And, and they, But guess what? Those two teenagers sitting in the back who got caught in premarital sex, oh, we're going to hold them accountable. Well, wait a minute. If you got people literally living in adultery, how can you hold them accountable? And then people say, well, what is the married couple supposed to do? Well, there was a time within church history, that they would say, well, they need to, they have to abstain. They're going to have to live a celibate life. And people are like, that's ridiculous. Well, you tell, you just told those teenagers who probably have so many hormones flowing through their body at a given time that they have to abstain. So if they have to, why don't they have to? But nobody follows any of it. It's just, we grab the Bible, we use it the way we want to use it. And when we start doing that, we start bashing and beating down. And we always beat down the people who are committing the sin that we're not committing. 
We want the compassion for us. We want the forgiveness and mercy for us. We want everyone else to get the wrath and the condemnation. This man walked into Walgreens and bashed someone with a Bible. Yes, he should be arrested. Yes, something should be done. But in a roundabout way, Christians go around bashing people in the face with the Bible all the time. I'm guilty of doing it. You're guilty of doing it. I've used the Bible in an incorrect way. You've used the Bible in an incorrect way. We can't go back and change what we've done, but we can become more sensitive going, am I truly using the Bible in a correct way? Or if I turned it into a baseball bat, smashing and hurting and damaging people's lives. It's, and the reason we do it is because our own natural sinful, we have a sinful nature. It's there. It's, it's so easy to fall into it. It's not even difficult. Because you've got the Bible that when you have, when you find a scripture, then it's, it's almost like God is on my side. Now I can use this. Now who, and you can, and that's why when you mix it with politics, that's when it becomes all messed up. It's, it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. And you see that kind of with the, the Sadducees, Right. Remember how the Sadducees was working to have Jesus killed? I think it's in John 18, 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the the palace of the Roman governor. But now it was early morning and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So here, they're working to have Jesus killed. They're working to have Jesus killed. The eternal son of God killed. And in the meantime, they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, we can't go in there. That'll make us unclean. So they're worried about their ceremonial cleanliness or uncleanliness while they're attempting to have someone murdered. But guess what? They would have said that they're doing the right thing to have that person murdered because they've got scripture that would condemn this person for blasphemy or for whatever they were accusing him of. Because you can always find a scripture somewhere, somehow to condemn or accuse someone of something. And you can call for capital punishment and want them dead. But and while you're in some case engaged in just hatred and not even following anything that the scriptures would teach, then on other areas you're like, but I I don't watch this or I don't do this or I don't do this. I'm I'm so perfect. But that person over there, you know, stone the heathen. Yeah, well, maybe the heathen that needs to be stoned is the one with the rocks in their hands. Oh, wait, I think we have a biblical story of that, right? I know some people argue it doesn't belong there, but we have the woman caught in adultery. Oh, they got scripture, right? We've got scripture. Okay, oh, let's catch this woman in adultery. It's amazing. The man doesn't show up. They bring the woman. And what, what's their whole thing? They Do they care about doctrine? Do they care about theology? They're using scripture and using a situation in order to try to trap Jesus. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees did this countless times. They would come with Jesus with a question and they didn't care about the answer. They were using scripture. They were using religion. They were using theology simply to try to trap Jesus. They, they, they always for selfish reasons. They didn't like the popularity of Jesus. They didn't, they didn't like the fact that Jesus may be a threat to their power and their position. So what are they going to do? They're going to use that religion, use scripture in order to try to condemn the eternal son of God. Oh, I've seen church members do this. They get upset with a pastor. They don't like a pastor. Oh, they'll find some scripture. Well, the pastor, you're not doing this. You're not right here, right here. It says you should do this. What's wrong with you? This church is crap. I'm not going to come back to this church. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe while you're grabbing the Bible and trying to condemn someone for what that pastor is doing or not doing, what about you look at the rest of the scriptures and apply it to yourself? Oh yeah, I, I've I've seen that happen so many times. Because if you're a church member, I'm telling you, you can find you you go through enough things in the Bible, you'll find something you can throw in the pastor's face. You can find some re- reason to condemn it. You you can you can find some re- reason to say that it's trash. You you can, you you can find some reason to to uh, condemn it. But yeah, while you're sitting there thumbing through Scripture to find something to condemn someone else, how about you stop some of those other scriptures and look in the mirror? 
When you pick up the Bible, do you see a mirror where you first see yourself? Or do you see a baseball bat where you can go smash someone else? Do you pick up the Bible and see a surgical instrument that you can do spiritual surgery on yourself? Or do you see a hammer and you can go smash everything like it's a nail? This man was arrested for actually bashing someone in the face. Belting is the word they used. So here's what I want you to do today. I think our best examples of this will be with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So today, just go through the New Testament. See if you can find minimum of three, maximum of five, of where the Pharisees or the Sadducees are basically either they're using scripture, they're using God, religion, they're using something like that. And they're using it in in a very negative way, in a way to, as a weapon, to hurt, to bash, to condemn, to control something. Try to find a minimum of three examples, maximum five. Find an example and just kind of write out briefly kind of what they were doing, kind of what they were trying to do. And then just look, and then just simply look at yourself and ask, have you done something similar? If you were a Christian parent, you probably use scripture in certain, some ways to try to control. And you can ask yourself, do you think what you did was right? Maybe you've done it to other people. Maybe it's been done to you. I've seen some really questionable things when it comes to how people use the Bible. And we see it now in politics so much, and it's messed up. The Bible is 66 books. There's so much there for scriptures that speak of condemnation or judgment or wrath. There are plenty of others that speak of justice and mercy and grace and forgiveness and loving even your enemy and turning the other cheek. The scriptures that speak of condemning, there are scriptures that speak of restoring, of scriptures that you think may give what a consequence should be. There may be other scriptures that seem to apply to not apply that consequence in any way, shape, or form. You can go find what you want, or you can be a student of all 66 books and try to always find a balance and go, okay, well, this seems to be this, but what about this and 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 this? Now, I want to I want to look at some more of these scriptures uh, so I can just give you some of the ones The John 18, 28 is where they're they're They lead Jesus from Caiaphas to the Roman governor, but they can't go in because they'll be ceremonially unclean. That is just the most insane thing I've ever seen. They're, they're really working to get a man killed and they're worried about being ceremonially unclean. Um, you you can look in Matthew 22 where the Sadducees question about marriage and resurrection. Do they really care about marriage and resurrection? Or are they simply using this religious question in order to try to trap Jesus? Um, well, we, we could look at John 11. You have Luke 18, 9 through 14, the Pharisee and the tax collector. You have Matthew 23, verse 20, a lot in Matthew 23. Those are just some, just kind of get you started. I, I kind of want to do them for you, but then you'll miss out on the, on the, on the, on the, on the benefit of this. All right. So three to five passages where the Pharisees or Sadducees are manipulating, using scripture almost as a weapon to hurt, to trap. They're not, they're not cured. About, they're, they, they just simply are using it. And then consider those examples and ask yourself, in what ways are you guilty of the same thing? I'm guilty. I've been guilty of it. I know I have. I'll I'll end with this. United States military. Airman Leadership School. Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. 
while I'm there at Airman Leadership School, one day in class, we walk in and they want to play this little game. We're all sitting at our desk and on the different, on the different walls in the classroom are things like agree, disagree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. And they're going to throw out these kind of controversial subjects. Now, the ultimate goal of this is to show you that when you work and when you're in the United States military, you're, you're with people from different backgrounds, different religions, different part of the country. And so you're going to have to learn to work together because some people can have very strong opinions about very different things, but we still have to work together for the ultimate mission. Whatever that mission may be, you got to sometimes work together. I know that's a wild concept. Now, I hated the whole thing. And the reason I hated the whole thing is to me, it's like they ask these questions and now all of a sudden people in the classroom are supposed to now act like that they're, you know, experts on morality, experts on ethics. They're somehow now experts on philosophy. And I'm like, I, I've been I've been around these people. They, they don't ever, they don't read anything. They don't study anything. And now they're going to give these strong opinions about these supposedly controversial ethical or moral dilemmas. I, I hated it. So I didn't even, I kept sitting in the middle going, I'm not playing your little reindeer game. I can't, I can't stand this. This is stupid. You people don't even talk about these kinds of things. And now all of a sudden you're all yelling and screaming like you're experts. And so it, to me, it was the, you're almost being manipulated and I didn't want to play the game, but I never forget. I'll never forget this. Now this is the 1990s. So we were still operating under don't ask, don't tell when it comes to homosexuality in the United States military. Someone could be clearly gay, but as long as you weren't to ask, they weren't to tell. It was this really weird thing. Hey, we know you are, but you can't tell me and I can't ask you. Now, the guy could sit, the guy across from you, he can sit there and talk about all his sexual exploits that he wants, but you can't say any. It's just, it was so, so weird. Okay, but all right. So I, I knew, I think the night before, a number of the people, the guys in the class had gone to a strip club or somewhere and they were talking about it. So, and, and there were people there who, uh, who uh, were, married, who were engaged in uh, uh, physical affairs. It was just, you know, all the just kind of stuff that possibly could go down. But then the subject of homosexuality came up and oh my goodness, people started yelling and screaming. It's wrong. It's disgusting. It's sinful. It, and, and, and so when push comes to shove, because in many cases, the instructor would play devil's advocate. Well, what makes it wrong? Why is it wrong? And, well, even the Bible says it's wrong. And when some of them said that, I literally almost just fell over in my chair. I'm like, you guys don't read the Bible. You don't go to church. I don't even know if you believe in God. And now you're going to pull out the Bible to condemn homosexuals. Well, let me tell you something. The Bible condemns your trip to the strip club. It condemns the pornography you're looking at. It condemns the affair you're having, just like it condemns me for all my lust and all of my issues. See, they didn't know what to do, so they were going to grab the Bible, and now, boom, I can win my argument. Boom, we can bash some people. Boom, we, should, we can condemn some people. <laughs> That's not, you don't walk into Walgreens and hit someone with your Bible. But too many Christians, we've walked through church history hitting people with the Bible. That's how people were killed in Salem during the Salem witch trials. And I've been to Salem multiple times. Love that place. Love learning the history of what happened during the witch trials. But that's, some of that stuff was completely messed up. But using, but using some scripture. Using some scripture. Not understanding context of civil law versus moral law versus ceremonial law. How Israel was to operate under a theocratic rule versus us not under a theocratic rule, nor should we ever want to be. Not even understanding any distinctions like that. And that's what happens when you don't make any of these distinctions and you don't understand it. Then the Bible just becomes this weapon and you start hitting people. So, find those examples, three minimum, five max of the Pharisees and Sadducees basically doing this type of thing with scripture. And then just spend today. You, you can do this. Ask your kids, hey, you think I ever used the Bible kind of as a weapon against you? Do you ever felt kind of like you were kind of abused or manipulated or controlled by how I use scripture? And be prepared for maybe a brutal answer. 
Ask friends. Ask family members. Ask your spouse. You may have even done it arguing with them. Ask people you know. Be ready to apologize. You can email me, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. That was supposed to be kind of a short little impromptu, but 45 minutes later. <laughs> ah, I don't know. I think, I think, look, to me, when I saw the news story and I saw that this man was walked into a Walgreens and belted someone in the face. I more looked at it as like, I wonder how many people I've belted in the face with the Bible, but in a spiritual way. Woe is me. I'm definitely guilty. Thanks for listening. God bless.